Hi, my name is Kevin Matthews and I'm an orthodist here with Advanced Orthopedic Designs and this is my son Alan, he works here, he's a technician, does all our ordering and lots of other stuff. Uh, we're starting to do central fab, we already do central fabrication for uh, a few facilities and what I would like to do today is to demonstrate the casting procedure that we prefer if we're going to do your fabrication. This is the way that I've been doing it for years, this is how I get the results that I get and how we get optimal outcomes is by having a good cast for to use for fabrication. Okay, typically what I use for uh, stockinette is a good stockinette. I don't use the real cheap thin stuff. Two and a half inch stockinette I find works for 95 percent of the adult population, and so. I like to have a good snug stocking at three inch tends to wrinkle too much. This molds real nicely to the foot. Okay. I use synthetic material for casting, so I always wear gloves and it is real sticky stuff. Now what I'm going to demonstrate here is really for any AFO, but I'm going to give marks for the turbo because the turbo is by far the most popular brace we make. So, for a turbo, I need the anterior tibial tubercle marked. On him, it's not prominent, so I just mark the insertion point of the patellar tendon. And all I do is just kind of put an upside down smile so I know that's where I want it to end. For all other AFOs, really all you need to do is mark the fibular head, or if you just want to mark the trim line, if it's head, do a semicircle, trim line, just put a mark like that and that will let me know where the proximal trim line. These marks are all important and really the only marks that I need. I would also prefer that you mark any bony prominences and for me, going back to school, I'm used to marking the base of the fifth metatarsal, the fifth metatarsal head, first metatarsal head, the navicular and both malali. If there's a Haglund's deformity on the posterior heel or anything else that stands out that you want us to take notice of, please mark it. I always cast non-weight bearing because I want the foot in its natural state. When I cast, I use 1 8 inch polyethylene as my cutting strip. It forms nicely. It's thick enough where the blade will never go through it and you can make it as wide as you'd like for uh, you don't want it too wide where it distorts your calf uh, but you know about three quarters five eighths to three quarters of an inch wide is really all you need for removing the cast I use a utility knife blade and basically I dull on the sander I go back on my fine sandpaper I round it and then I sharpen it with the sandpaper which in fact dulls it so that if I do miss the plastic, it'll just be a scratch, unless I'm pushing real hard, which I tend not to do. Um, I've been doing this 30 years. I've used many techniques. This is my favorite because it's the simplest. I've never missed and hit someone. And you'll see when I cast that I really highlight and mark my cutting strip so I know exactly where it is. And just make sure that you cut it off before your cast sets up. If your cast sets up completely, uh, you may need to get a cast saw. All right, so I, I, with, with adult patients, the vast majority, I use a four inch and a three inch. I use the, the tech form. Uh, there are other good materials out there, but I find these are relatively inexpensive. I think 42 bucks for four inch, 32 for three inch, and so on, right around there. Uh, is that right? Close enough? Yeah, uh, it's around there, yeah. All Pretty right. close. Alan does our order. So. Okay, so what I want to do for, for my technique, I start at the top and work my way down. What's important is that we get a good, accurate representation of the leg. So what I want to do, and I just move it off to the side a little bit, you can mark the crest of the tibia also. I don't always do that. I do two rolls at the top, and then I go down and divide that into about thirds. Don't put any tension on your casting material. That's what causes 
the wrinkles or the bumps in your model, just just lay it on there. Just go overlap by thirds and just lay it on. You can give it a gentle tug if you got a little wrinkle, but don't stretch it or pull on it. I get the first, the four inch will typically go down to the foot, and then the three inch will tie it in for the foot. I use warm water, pretty warm water, not cool, uh, just so it sets up quicker. So if you if you like to work slow, like a practitioner that works here, Imelda, she's she likes to work her models a little longer. She uses cool water, and then just overlap your material so it's strong. I know a lot of people pride themselves or brag, say they can get the whole foot in one four inch or one five inch roll, but believe me, that's just not the best cat. So what I want to do once I get it on is massage it in, get good contour, make sure there's no bridging of material. When you stretch the casting material, it can bridge across the malayli, make them look less prominent because it doesn't follow the contours. When you just lay it on, it really does follow the contour as well. Highlight your cutting strip. Then what I do is I take my middle finger and put it under the cutting strip. My forefinger, put it in the sulcus of the toes. My thumb, I put in the metatarsal region where you would put a metatarsal pad. What that does, and I grab the foot, that allows me to manipulate this foot any way I want so I can get my forefoot balanced with my rear foot. Relax your leg. Now, I want to dorsiflex the foot. But I'm not concerned with a 90 degree uh, angle. I'll fix that on the bandsaw. It's also important that we line the foot up in line of progression. I like to use the second toe in line with the knee. That'll give me slight toe up. That is very important. If you just got this foot turned out here, that will not correlate to line of progression. It's important that you get the second toe in line with the knee. Then I dorsiflex the foot to maintain that angular relationship. I can use the tips of my fingers to pronate the forefoot or I can use my whole hand to supinate it. So I'm using my hand to maintain the forefoot balanced. Then with my other hand, I'm massaging into the ST groove. My thumb is highlighting the lateral arch and my forefinger is highlighting the ST groove, really marking it uh, so I have a very well-defined heel and base of the fifth. Okay, now it's ready to come off. You don't want to let this sit up all the way. And just run down your strip there. I always keep one finger in contact with the cast. When you're like this, you can slide off. If you've got a finger guiding you, much easier to stay on line. As soon as you go offline a little bit, stop. Go back and correct. Uh, this technique is very effective. You do not have to use this technique. I've used many techniques. Uh, you can use the, the hook blade with the cascade strip with the raised little bumps on it and cut it off with a hook blade. When I was in El Paso, they used a real neat technique. They used surgical tubing that they put along the leg here, but before they cast it, they just took Vaseline and lubed it up, laid it on there, casted it in place. Once it was set up, they slid the tube out and they had uh, just some heavy duty shears. They just ran right through that channel and cut off. All of those work just fine. The main thing is not to stretch your casting material. Get a good, nice model. And then I'm a big advocate for using good bandage scissors. These scissors are going on three years old. Same pair of scissors, they were powder coated and now you can see they're filthy just from the oils in my hand. Same pair for three years casting patients every day and, and numerous patients and they still work like a dream. You, they cost about 30 bucks for a pair so you can get six pair of those cheap ones for the same price I go through this but you'll go through 40 pairs of the cheap ones and I'll still be using these. 
Just make sure it's German steel. Uh, they're amazing. All right. This may hurt just a little bit. <laughs> Some of those hairs sneak through. All right. So, I want you to take a look at my model. Um, you can see I've got him set in plantar flexion. No worries. That is not a problem. I have a very beautiful, smooth model. And we're going to pour this model so that I can show you what it looks like. You can see where my hand really identified uh, the ST groove, so I know right where I'm going to cut. Really highlighted the base of the fifth and the lateral arch. And it's perfectly smooth. And I also know that I've got the right amount of toe out because I always do in my cast. All right? Now, before this sets up, if you're going to use us for central fab, please remove the stock net. And do that while it's still wet, it comes out very easy. Not too wet, because it'll distort your cast. So just before it gets fully hard and gets really bonded in there. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and I'll show you how I wedged the cast. So now what we're going to do is wedge this. You can see that I have him set in plantar flexion. Almost every AFO cast that I take is in plantar flexion. The reason for that is if you push too hard up into dorsiflexion, you can distort the foot. So all I want to do is get them close, and that's plenty close. What I look for when I wedge it on the bandsaw is this is where my ankle joint is. I don't typically mark it. I'm just showing you what I'm looking at when I wedge it. And then I'm going to wedge it here into the joint, and then same thing back here so that when I dorsiflex it, it'll be at approximately the center of rotation at the ankle. So, it's important that I maintain that external rotation when I wedge it. And we cut out a wedge. And if you're good, the wedge will be symmetrical on both sides. And in the back, what I want to do So that it hinges at the ankle. Okay. Then I'll come over here, check my angle, and for me, I basically want posterior aspect of the heel to be slightly anterior to the posterior aspect of the calf. Not much. So I look at that there. And there, now it's ready to be poured. And it will be more dorsiflex when it's finished because I'm going to flatten this out some. But now it's ready to be sealed and poured. So, casting technique, beautiful cast, and we're going to pour it. And then I'll show you the positive model and how smooth it is and how nice it is and how easy it is to modify when you have a really nice cast. Good vertical heel. I do have a little bit of forefoot supination. I'm not worried about that. I will balance that out in my modifications. I typically have a little bit of supination. You'll see that big old knot right there where my thumb was. My fingers were in the sulcus. My thumb was here. And I'm locked on tight so that I can manipulate that foot. And some patients express a little discomfort. And I just tell them, oh, hang on, I'll have this off in a minute. But this is going to get filled in. I'm not going to put a big old metatarsal pad there unless there's a reason to. The reason for that is so I can latch onto that forefoot, not distort the rest of my cast, really highlight the metatarsal heads, but when I do that, I can really manipulate that foot any way I want, and they tolerate being locked on real tight there. And then again, these hands and fingers were just massaging the foot in here while it was setting up. And then I'll rub, massage, and then just shape. And then I get a nice lateral arch, nice definition in through the medial arch, so I can see where that sustentaculum tali groove, the ST groove is, for when I really want to isolate the heel. Okay, here's the AFO, and it's uh, been poured. And what I want you to see is just what a difference a, a good cast takes. And the trick is just laying it on and not stretching it or pulling it. But 
you can see, for me, I can just visualize the finished product when I have just a well-molded uh, cast to work with. So, anyway, that's all I wanted you to see.